Good afternoon, everyone. Councilmember Dustin Hillis, Chair of the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee, call this meeting to order. I've been joined by my colleagues to my immediate right, our Vice Chair, Councilmember Amos, followed by Councilmember Boone, and then to my immediate left, Councilmember Norwood, and we do constitute a quorum. I will make a motion to approve our agenda. Is second. there a second? Second by Vice Chair Amos. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. Please vote. The vote is closed. Four yeas, zero nays. The agenda is adopted. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of the prior meeting. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Amos. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Four yeas, zero nays. Those minutes are approved. Moving on to public comment. First up, we have uh, Ms. Henri Jordan. Hey, everyone is here. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. But he blesses the habitation of the Jets, five verse, 33 chapter, 33rd verse. The needy neighbor is to be helped. The innocent neighbor is to be respected and left alone. And the wicked neighbor is not to be envied. Help those who need help. The guiltless to be respected and unjust action should not be desired. James Griff is unjust to me and proud of it but God has cursed injustice. I need to work Jesus' business, his way, for it to be blessed. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Matthew 22, chapter 39, verse. The one who shall respect a person is a transgressor of the law. People put their behinds in my face, don't love me as thyself. Christ give us Christ's gift was given to me to fight for our protection in order for me to receive protection. If you found out you worked against your protection, you will be hurt. Am not the oppressor and choose none of his ways. Five verse, third, chapter 31st verse. A simple definition of envy is to want what belongs to someone else. Oppressor definition of personal group that exercise authority or power over another in a harsh and burdensome way. God said, don't go this way. The Atlanta police will not take pictures of James Griff coming on my roof for crime prevention. So the last shall be first and the first last for many be called but few chosen. Matthew 26, chapter 16, verse. The reference seems to be the robe of righteousness which we must receive from the Lord in order to attend the marriage feast. The practice of oppression is a robe of unrighteousness. Not because I said it, because Jesus says it. He that leadeth in the captivity shall go in the captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is a pace in the faith of the saints, Revelation 13, 10. If you lead someone into bondage, then ye shall go into bondage. If you kill someone with the word of the law, then ye must be killed with the word of the law. The saints preach the word to set you free from serving Satan. If you seek to kill, you shall be killed. God promised it in his word. Thank you. And uh, before we move along public comment in my haste, I failed to recognize Council President Shipman. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, next up will be Chris Brown. Good afternoon. I also have some extra time that's being donated uh, from the body. Um, I have nine minutes, Mr. Brown. Yes, sir. So good afternoon. Uh, I came down. Um, one in my role is uh, APAPS, Atlanta Planning Advisory Board, Public Safety Chair. 
I came down also in my capacity as a, as a resident here in the city of Atlanta. Uh, many of you all have come down to uh, public safety to uh, talk about the works that you guys do uh, with various stakeholders in various communities around the city. And we know this ACDC uh, Fulton County situation has been one, um, for some that would say unfavorable, but some would say that it's favorable because it's been stalled. Uh, we lost another member of our community uh, just this past week uh, in the custody of the Fulton County Jail. And we've been speaking to a lot of people, and people talk to me, encouraging me to come speak about this topic. And it's one of those topics where, you, you know, it's, it's very heated. But I want to get straight to the point to where we can't wait too much longer. Uh, we can be creative and innovative as thought leaders. I've talked to some of the commissioners from Fulton County. I've talked to some of the people who have these thoughts and ideas about utilizing some of our current infrastructure uh, to make means to some of the things that we have going, like the, the like PAD, um, operating in extended longer, longer hours, being able to use the uh, public health facilities, uh, some which are closed in our communities that, that are blighted, uh, but, but can be used um, in pre-arrest diversion and for the services. Uh, there's also an opportunity to use a training ground for uh, community policing for officers that are on light duty, uh, officers that may, uh, may be uh, needing additional training because we talked about training hours and extending how much training our officers would get here in the city of Atlanta. Uh, I think all of those are great ideas and I think that we responded to the uprising uh, over the last few years with innovative practices in coming to create all these task forces and committees and bodies, but now it's time to act. We have to do something by making sure that our young people are looking at what we're doing, including the water boys, uh, in terms of some of these repeat offenders, which include some of these youthful, uh, what we would call them offenders. Uh, what, what is our plan? I think that we need Fortson County on board with us, uh, with some of the services that they provide, and some of their current funding and infrastructure. And I think that this collaboration can be one um, to, look, to look forward to uh, as it relates to the city of Atlanta. Uh, I used to work for the city of Atlanta back in 2007. We had a, uh, a project that we did with corrections where we actually trained inmates. And we had, we had like a workforce program uh, where we trained them to help provide service to the city of Atlanta by cleaning um, the right-of-ways and cleaning off uh, the exits and some things that even GDOT was responsible for. But we was able to use those services and manpower to one, employ skills, uh, two, to actually cut time to those offenders and then actually make them whole. But they also need something on, on the other side when they go home. Uh, and something to return to. And I think that the city of Atlanta as a best in class city can be that model. Um, it's, we're not here to make profit, so it's not a money thing. And we've received a lot of funding in terms of money. So I don't think it's a money problem. I think that it's a lot of politics that's in between this. And uh, as, as a citizen, I just like, I don't want to see as much of the politics, but more of the thought leader saying, I'm, I'm going to be brave enough to make the hard decisions. And so I'm just coming here to uh, to extend that olive branch and to use uh, APAP, uh, the Land and Planning Advisory Board, as a medium for community engagement uh, to be able to take those, those young people and those people who needed these services and to put them in the community. Let's centralize them. Uh, in 2018, uh, we, we undertook a cyber attack. Uh, we found that basically that a lot of our assistants were hit, but we also understood that a lot of our uh, nonprofit providers, we don't have a central database in terms of how we provide service, who receives services, who denies services. Um, so there's opportunity, again, in what we're doing. We have a lot of great partners who invest into the city. We are, you know I mean, Atlanta's been one of the, it's one of the greatest places to live in the country. Uh, I, I can attest to that. And as we talk about education and our young people, I want to employ, we talk and put emphasis on our young people. We're sending the wrong message. Uh, when, we, when I look at these meetings and we're going back and forth about trying to hold up um, that process. Um, in terms of people getting out of jail, I know people that say they spent three days even after making bun just to even try to get out of jail. That's even after I went to see the judge, and that's assuming that they was guilty. They was just there for whatever reason of their, uh, whatever reason, uh, but they should be allowed the same quality of life, uh, if not better, while on the inside. Because I've also heard people say that sometimes being incarcerated was, was the best thing for them. Uh, they was able to see uh, what they was doing. They needed something to slow them down in a buffer. So they was appreciative of some of the services uh, as, as incarceration is not meant to be punitive, but meant to be more restorative. So I came here to just make sure that everybody know that we're all watching and that we want to participate in, uh, in the process. We want to encourage you to move forward uh, with that piece. I wish Tiffany then was here because my, my friends in labor and my friends in activism, um, we share some of the same sentiments. Sometimes how we get there, uh, we don't always agree. But I do think that we have an opportunity to, one, review all of the people that we intake. I know that we're waiting for information, 
And I think we also have a, com uh, a commission uh, that's been commissioned to receive information and data that's, that, that employs uh, all these various different agencies. Um, we should strengthen that collaboration to get that information. We, we, we can develop a process where we intake the people that we arrest here in the city of Atlanta to get it on the front end. We don't have to wait to the back end to get it from the sheriff. If we really want to be sincere about how we get this information and we want to really truly get people the services that they need, then we should, we should be trying to employ those practices in our operating procedures. So I just want us to think forward, think innovative. We've got great people at the top. Uh, I just think they need to be empowered. I think we actually put the police and the correction officers and the people at the top uh, in the middle of this political battle for political will. So uh, I want to invite you guys. We're going to schedule our next APAP meeting. I want to invite you guys out. Ms. Norwood has been there before. Uh, I've done things in the community with uh, uh, Councilmember Amos and Councilmember Boone. Um, these things, and we work with the sheriff as well because they provide a lot of those same services uh, to protect us and do traffic details and what have you. And so we get a chance to talk to these people. I think that you should talk to the officers. Uh, I think you already have. I think that's plain and clear to where we are right now, that we boldly, in our next council meeting, take that step. But I think that you should talk to the activists and, and, and address their concerns as well uh, with a plan um, to be more solid to, to, to follow up with because we hadn't been the best to follow up in terms of information. So as we talk to our, our counterparts in Fulton County, as we talk to our counterparts in um, ACDC, as we talk about public health, we're still in the pandemic, uh, it hasn't went anywhere. I implore you guys to please think this through. Let's improve the quality of life for these for these residents. Let's let's show them that that we care and that these services that, that we have, I'm looking for them. We're we're taking these services that we got and we're looking for all the services that we can to make sure that these residents have them. There are people out here with vouchers who can't find places to stay, which is leading to homelessness, uh, which may be also contributing to the crime. So if by if if the services are rough, if the services are there, let's make sure we get them to the people who need them the most. And I thank you all for the service that you do. Uh, and I hope to see you at the next APAP meeting. Councilmember mm -hmm. Norwood. Yes, I know it's public comment, but I just wanted to clarify because Mr. Brown said something that was important. Uh, yes, the state of Georgia, through the Georgia Department of Transportation, back in the early 2000s, gave the city a grant of $350,000 to clean the interstate ramps and the state roads that are located inside the city. And I am now a district council person, no longer an at-large council person, but that's when I worked with DOT to do that. And Pat Labatt used the men at the ACDC to give them a way to be outside, to get something done. They closed up houses, but they also got the city cleaner. And I think that is right now um, something that this city could take to take to GDOT and say, let's reinstitute this. It's their responsibility to clean up those interstate ramps, off ramps, and state roads. They would love to have someone else do it so they don't have to send a crew in to inside the city. So um, I would like for us to pursue that. Thank you, Councilmember Norwood. Next, Sandra Reed. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Hillis, do you see my name on there? I signed up um, I before. I do not, but would you like to be added at the, at the end of the list? Um, I was one of the first one to sign up after Ms. Jordan. Got okay, Mr. Dewan Robinson on the list. He's not showing up on the computer. Ms. Reed and Ms. Um, Scott donated the time to Chris Brown. Okay, Mr. Robinson, you go ahead. Uh, when it comes to public safety... Oh, just one second. We have a Derek Green here as well. Okay, you'll be next, Mr. Green. Uh, when it comes to public safety... Um, I think um, some of you guys um, have your own idea of what public safety means. Um, it's more than just the police, the fire. Um, lack of housing, that's a public safety issue. Homelessness is definitely a public safety issue. Um, council, you guys keep approving the same more um, vendors and nonprofits that we've been giving the money to since I was a kid. I've been seeing them do the same thing. Um, Jose William once told me, I was 12 years old, I'll never forget. 
He said, Andrew Young was one of my closest friends. He said, the day he got elected, I called and told him, we'll be down at City Hall protesting against you tomorrow. And it's all good because when you're friends, you can do that. You don't want nobody that's standing beside you just because it's, you know what I'm saying, to go along to get along. So, Mr. Shipman, you're in charge of sending out the appointments for everybody. When it comes to public safety, we got to get people that really know the city, really know what's going on, and really care because we're in a state of emergency in Atlanta, and it's been brewing for years, and we have a split when it comes to you guys and the public, and we got to redefine what public safety really means because what affects the white neighborhood affects the black neighborhoods, what affects the gay community affects the straight community. Across the board, point blank, period. Like, we've been playing politics in Atlanta for so long. I'm born and raised here. And we got to just stop doing that, man, because now we are really at a crisis that majority of you don't know how to fix. And you won't say you don't know how to fix it, but you got to work with the public who know how to fix it. And you got to start working with the same old group that y'all been giving them money to for years. They haven't done nothing. They're not going to do nothing. And you guys just got to wake up and just see what's really going on in our communities as opposed to seeing it on the news. Like we can prevent some of these things from happening if we tap into people who really for the community. To me and Mr. Brown and other people, we don't come down here just to speak out in front of y'all. We come down here because we actually give a damn, man. We really do. So when you have a gift that God gave you, you can't run from it. I would love to be doing other things, but my passion is for the people. But we hold you guys accountable. I mean, you guys say you're going to do everything when you're running for office. You know what I'm saying? You not only need the money, you need the votes. And you're willing to say whatever to get our votes. But when you get out here, same old, same old. And we just got to stop that. And we have to really redefine what public safety really means. Because the way we're going at it, we're overlooking the main things that really affects our community as a whole. And at the end of the day, you guys know all of us are in it together, gay, straight, white, and black, but we just got to stop playing politics and separating each other. Next is Derek Green. Good afternoon. I'm Derek Green, Vice Chair, MPUJ, resident of Dixie Hills Community. I have three quick issues. First, uh, we got some news. We had cameras that are scheduled. Thank you both for joining. These are other residents of Dixie Hills. Uh, we had got some news that some cameras that we were, had been promised for the last three years before current council that uh, the matching funds uh, may not be available. And it's a very big concern of ours because it leads to two other issues. The first being is that we have long term, uh, well known facilities or houses that are moving drugs and other illegal paraphernalia throughout the community. Without those cameras, not only are we getting illegal dumping, not only are we getting the increased traffic, we had, we had um, I believe in the last 18 months, we had uh, three deaths. One was, a body was brought into the community, uh, one was shot at the pool, um, and one um, baby, unfortunately, was killed at the store two houses down from me. Um, but these people are coming out of the community because they know that they're not being watched outside of the eyes that are in the community. So we need those cameras. Second thing is we need a plan to get rid of these known drug houses. Um, they've been on, they've been here before I got moved back to the city. So it's just gone on too long with that. And the third thing is, um, this related to that as well. We have a lot of seniors. We have a lot of, um, um, adults who've been there for a long time that are having to drive out of our community to get services that they should get inside our community. Um, right now, PALS operates our recreation center and um, they operated without any oversight from the Atlanta, um, Atlanta Parks and Recs. The problem with that is they have now um, a longer term history because this started in 2019, have 67 pages of documents with emails. Councilman Amos is familiar with some, a lot of this. Um, but 67 documents where we cannot even have the conversation for a 20, now three year old MOU that was signed by Chief Beverly Hall in 1999 to get renegotiated, reevaluated by the community so that our residents that live in the community, that pay taxes in the community, will have a place and resources and services 
that will allow them a safe place to do that. So those three things are urgent and important. Um, and there's a long time history of these things being ignored um, prior to before prior council. But we need it recognized and worked on now. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Green. And I will will say we'll, I will respond to one of those. Uh, we do have Deputy Chief Peak and Chief Sherbaum with us today as APD is doing their quarterly presentation. So please make sure that you provide them uh, any information you have on the locations and addresses of those uh, purported drug houses, please. And also our solicitor as well. Uh, that concludes public comment. So speaking of, we will move on to our presentations. And first up, we do have Atlanta Police Department and Chief Darren Sherbaum. Chief. Good afternoon. Uh, Chairman Hillis, members of the Public Safety Committee, uh, President Shipman, uh, fellow citizens of the city. It's good to see everyone here today. I'm on behalf of all of the men and women of the Atlanta Police Department here to present the quarterly report uh, of, of our efforts on behalf of the communities. I'm going to start first with a uh, significant reorganization that we uh, endeavored on this year, as you're aware, uh, during this time, and we went into a new budget year uh, during uh, this quarter. Uh, we did two things the Atlanta Police Department to, to ensure we are properly positioned to better serve every community, every council district we have. Two of those were, one was around our reorganization to ensure that our business operations are optimal, and the other one is around crime fighting. I'm going to go first to the business operations. Uh, at the beginning of the fiscal year, we onboarded a chief administrative officer, which some of you may know, uh, Mr. Peter Amon. And then we took a number of our operations that are uh, aligned with the facilities, the fleet, the men and women that serve us, both in our professional and our sworn capacity, and move those uh, operations under the chief administrative officer. You see there on the, on the board some of those examples are code enforcement, all of our administrative uh, functions, as well as employee services, the E911 center, our physical uh, management, as well as technical services. Now, this is already uh, having a benefit for us. Uh, we were able to, the, by the work of the COO, add, and thanks to your support, additional repair services uh, for our fleet to get our squad cars back on the street and into the communities. Uh, we've also seen uh, a number of areas moving forward for the uh, building of the new public safety training center, as well as operations for, for the men and women. So we're, we're excited about this over time. We will start moving some of our sworn personnel that are currently in these operations, replacing them with uh, professionals that know uh, more about the operations of facilities, vehicles, things of that nature, and be able to move sworn assets into the crime fighting uh, arena and bring professionals on board that are more stable uh, in that role. The other area that we did in the reorganization was bringing all of our training and our policies and standards under one deputy chief. Uh, as you know, we're one of the highest trained law enforcement agencies in the state. Uh, the state of Georgia actually has the lowest number of hours that are mandated to become a police officer, which is 10 weeks in a day. Uh, we're very proud that the men and women that serve you will train for 35 weeks before they are ever assigned to any neighborhood in the city. And to make sure that we continue to take that premier training uh, model and move it to all areas of the department, whether you're here for two, your second year on the department or your 30th year, to ensure that we have consistent quality training to serve you uh, that meets that standard we set forward for ourselves. Many of you support our Atlanta Police Leadership Institute initiatives uh, by joining us in those areas. That's where we're training every member of the department to be a leader, to be a public servant. Uh, and we, this is our efforts to ensure that that is informing all areas. And then our policies and standards, as you know, uh, we are an accredited law enforcement agency, or we are a state certified agency of the 18,000 law enforcement uh, agencies in the United States, less than 700 are accredited. And so we're very proud to have that distinction. And this is the area of the department that works to make sure that we maintain those standards and that we're consistently adopting best practices uh, to be better servants to every community uh, in your district. Another area of the reorganization that occurred in the, uh, in the third quarter of this year uh, was aligning our crime fighting initiatives to be much more intelligence driven. And as you will see, we brought in narcotics efforts, our violent crime interdiction efforts, the crime lab, uh, as well as our ID unit under the uh, criminal investigations division. What that has allowed us to do as we develop intelligence uh, related to gang activity in the city, intelligence related to robberies, uh, property crimes, we're able to deploy resources much quickly as it is determined at the investigative level, and we're able to take real-time intelligence from the field to influence the investigations. What we also added during this time was a number of uh, 
intelligence analyst to the department uh, as we enter to the new budget year that allows us to be much more informed uh, as we're fighting crime in the city. We're excited about this reorganization. We think it makes us better at what we do. It makes us better servants in your particular districts, uh, will allow us to realign how we serve you, uh, will allow us to, as I stated earlier, real reallocate sworn assets to community engagements and crime fighting and leave stable uh, professional leadership over the areas that support the men and women of the department as they serve your community. I'm going to look at crime real quick as we uh, move into uh, the other areas of the presentation. When I last presented to this group, uh, as we were ending the second quarter of the year, you may recall uh, that at that time our uh, crimes against persons was actually up 6% and crimes against property at 6% and then we were 6% overall uh, in the city. And I'm glad to report that today as we, as we report out to you and because of the work of the men and women of the Atlanta Police Department, our partner agencies, we've actually seen a decline over the summer in those areas. We're currently down 2% at the, at the end of the quarter in crimes against a person. And I hope you please take note of the decrease in the homicide rate in the city. When I last presented to you, uh, we were at 23% of our homicide rate being up at the end of the second quarter. And because of the men and women that serve you fighting the gangs, guns, and drugs, because of our partnerships with various law enforcement agencies, as we ended the quarter, our homicide rate was 1% up. And it really speaks uh, to the work of the men and women that are, that are serving you. You'll also note the reduction in our aggravated assaults being 6% up at the end of the, of the second quarter and now being 1% down as we go into the final quarter of the year, and also a reduction in the rapes being reported in the city from 11% up at the end of the second quarter to 18% at that time. We also saw a continued reduction in our robberies. Why this is important is robberies is the second highest motivator for homicides in our city. So the work of the men and women of the department to quickly engage those crews, disrupt those crews before uh, they can be out, out of the city has assisted in us seeing that reduction of our homicides down to 1% at the end of the uh, third quarter. Now, one area we continue to be challenged in is our motor vehicle theft. Why they're down for the year, we are seeing an uptick in our 28-day trends, and that is largely around the theft of Kias. And you only have to look to the, the news, social media reports to understand why that vehicle is, is easily stolen. So we encourage anyone uh, that is listening to this report out today, if you own a Kia, uh, please invest in a club or other device that you can affix to your steering wheel uh, that will help you deter being a victim of a crime. And that is a easy investment for you to be able to, uh, to, be able to combat that area. While motor uh, thefts from motor vehicles uh, is still up 11%, that is actually a decrease from 15% up when we last presented to this body. As the city continues to grow and prosper, and we see a lot of parking decks uh, being in place that weren't there just six months ago, uh, certainly not a year ago, uh, we ask individuals of the city to please be involved in smart, clean car campaign. We ask that if you own a parking deck, uh, that you invest in cameras and integrate those cameras to the Connect Atlanta. We ask that you work with our community liaison unit to learn the smart ways to protect your property, uh, ensure that when citizens come to visit you, uh, that they have a safe time while they park their vehicle. And we hope to see decreases in that area as, as well uh, as we have others. Burglar remains the one category that continues to be up around the same areas it was up over last year, and we see that occurring in two areas. We have a number of construction sites in the city, homes being built, uh, uh, commercial properties being built, and those are targeted uh, for their building supplies as well as their tools. And then we see uh, burglaries around storage units. Now, we have arrested a number of individuals this year uh, for burglary, and we, we hope we look forward to the courts amplifying that work. Uh, but we also ask that uh, if you're building something in the city, please engage our community liaison unit. We're going to do a, a, an assessment for you to let you know how you can be the safest and what uh, you should bring to bear uh, to make sure you have a safe construction site. I just do, I do want to focus real quickly on the homicides, as I mentioned before. As you can see, what the 28-day trend was as we ended quarter number two, and then as we end quarter number three, the work of the men and women on your, on your department, the sharp reduction in the 28-day trend as well as the year to date. The number one motivator for homicides in our city remains escalating disputes, disputes over unpaid bills, disputes over infidelity, disputes over parking spaces, who ate the last food. Those are very challenging for us as a police department to challenge and uh, to impact. And we still work with our partners uh, to be able to work in those areas, our faith-based communities, violence interrupters, all those that are working collaboratively with the Atlanta Police Department to combat that. Where we have been effective 
is impacting those homicides that are motivated by narcotic stealing in our city, that are motivated by gangs in our city, and guns being in the wrong hands. And I, I want to give credit to the men and women of the police department. If you do not follow us on social media, please do. You will see the great work of your, your officers in these spaces, doing the dangerous work, arresting dangerous individuals and removing guns from their hands before they can harm in any of your districts. And so when you see a reduction like that, please do thank the men and women of the Atlanta Police Department. we we'll also have been very fortunate this year is the Office of uh, Nightlife and Entertainment has been a very strong partner in areas, and we have seen a noticeable decrease of crime around those areas. And as we add more cameras and more lighting, and we join with our partners, it will continue to invest uh, in the reduction of homicides in our city. Aggravated assaults, the same thing. If I could just point your attention to the uh, person shot, you will see where we were uh, at the end of quarter two at a 9% reduction of the year and then 12% or 12% reduction at the end of quarter three. Goes very back to what I just stated earlier about our, our efforts to fight homicides. Uh, again, this is a credit of the men and women of the department as well as our partner agencies who join us frequently, such as the Fulton County Sheriff's Department, the ATF, uh, as well as the District Attorney's Office and others uh, that we are proud to call partners in our fight for a, a safer city. I do want to speak for a moment on Operation Heat Wave. We are an intelligence-driven police department. We want to ensure that as we work for the safety of our neighborhoods, we're doing that in a manner that is collaborative, uh, that is using a scalpel uh, to address the locations and the individuals that may be harming and causing crime in our city. Operation Heat Wave was a collaborative effort. If you look to the right of that screen, you will see uh, a variety of APD assets that we brought to bear, not just our gang unit, but officers from every one of our zones, our aviation unit, our intel unit, as well as our armed crimes unit. But we were joined by our partners. We have the Georgia State Patrol, we have the ATF, we have the Fulton County District Attorney's Office, as well as the State Attorney General's Office that joined us in this city over the summer. We focused on 32 locations which intelligence told us was driving the violent crime in the city. And we looked at individuals within those, those half-mile radiuses of the 32 locations that were wanted on probation or parole, or we had information that said they were engaged in activity that was pointing toward violence. Throughout the course of the summer, we conducted 40 targeted arrests. We brought the gang charge 29 times, and we took 21 guns out of the hands of individuals that were intent on using them in our city, some of which are pictured here. When we look at the effectiveness of Operation Heat Wave, we compare the exact same time from 2021 to the, to the time frame in 2022 when we conducted this operation. And you will see on your report, homicides during that same time were reduced 29% in the city, persons shot 26% in the city, and robbery, which is the second highest motivation uh, for homicides in our city, dropped 14%. This is good work by the men and women of the department that is good work by our partners. Uh, we will start a second rendition of that to run through the summer uh, and then the last of the month that will be starting very shortly. We are being joined in that by the Department of Justice. The ATF is returning as well as DeKalb, Clayton and Cobb County Police Departments, the Morehouse uh, Police Department as well as the Clark Atlanta Police Department are joining us in this initiative. Now I would like to tell you all that those uh, uh, five agencies are placing police officers on our city streets, but they're not. What they are doing is meeting us on a collaboration meeting that occurs where we share, in share intelligence that shows that gangs that are active in Cobb are active in Atlanta and Clayton in Atlanta, as well as DeKalb, and then they deploy back to their specific neighborhoods to be able to take that intelligence to fight crime collaboratively with us. And so we're, we, we believe, we are optimistic that we will see a continued uh, trajectory for the reduction in crimes that we can impact as law enforcement agencies as we work with our partners. And I do want to point this out. Earlier this year, we made a commitment to train every one of our investigators as gang investigators. The model prior to that had been using a specialized unit to be able to do the anti-gang work in the city. We believe that every member of this police department should be a gang fighter, but we're starting first with our investigators. So if you're investigating car break-ins, burglaries, robberies, thefts from vehicles, that there may be a nexus to gang activity, we want the charge brought then. So far this w year, your police department has brought the gang charge 208 times compared to 69 last year. And I think that speaks to the commitment of this police department to be able to fight crime wherever it may be and fight crime smartly and do it in conjunction with our, our state, our federal, and our county partners. In our efforts against gangs, guns, and drugs, I do want to point just for a moment for our efforts to remove guns from the wrong hands in our city. 
And you will see this year we have removed 1,903 weapons from the street. Many of those are in the hands of felons at the times they were, re they were removed in drug dealing operations or being used in the furtherance of a crime. Now, I do want to thank everyone that supported our gun buyback program. Uh, where we were able to remove uh, 302 guns from the streets in four hours uh, by citizens that said, I too want to have a part in a, in a safe city. So I want to thank everyone that came out on a beautiful uh, Sunday, uh, or Saturday morning, I should say, at the uh, Civic Center and that participated in that and the men and women of the police department that were involved, the mayor's office that was uh, promoted this project, sought through as part of their, um, their safety, their week, initiating week of peace and then the Atlanta Police Foundation who donated the funds to make that a successful buyback program. Just a moment ago, a, a citizen from Dixie Hills was speaking about the impact of drug dealing operations in their community. And I do wanna stop and pause on that for just a moment. If there is a drug dealing operation in your apartment building, in your neighborhood, it is a ticking time bomb for violence. I've said it before at this podium, and I wanna say that again. We can draw back to a number of aggravated assaults and a number of homicides in the city directly related, related to drug dealing, either someone trying to take a territory or trying to hold a territory or coming for the drugs and the guns that may be present. On the screen there, you see some of the work that was done in the third quarter of this year by the Atlanta Police Department. 22 warrants served during that time, and these warrants, when they are served, and again, please watch us on social media, is the men and women of this police department going into a dangerous location that is already fortified and generally has the firearms to protect it from another group coming for the drugs or the money. So your men and women going to those environments, doing it safely, even the individuals that we're striving to apprehend that day, we want a safe outcome for them. And the men and women of this department doing that over and over. During the quarter, we have seized, uh, we have seized year to date 87 guns, 68 search warrants year to date, and we have just in the month of uh, quarter alone, 22 of those. You see a number of those on the screen. The left is the drugs um, of you're looking at. You see the money was there, but you see the firearms on the right side of the screen uh, that is being used to protect it for that operation. So uh, if the gentleman from uh, Dixie Hills will please stand by, we do want to speak to him. But there's a number of ways to be able to report suspicious activity to us. You can send it through Crime Stoppers. You can send an email. You can call our narcotics tip line. Um, Ladies and gentlemen of this committee, I, we get many uh, informations from your office and we appreciate that and we act on that. Sometimes it moves quickly and sometimes it takes a while for us to do the work we need to do to make a good case. Uh, but this is one of the areas we are continuing to fight on your behalf and please continue to be a conduit from your constituents to us when you see criminal activity and when certainly when you see drug dealing operations. Just want to highlight this one real quick uh, in the quarter that we're reporting out on. We did have the largest drug seizure ever in the history of the Atlanta Police Department with 65 kilograms of cocaine, uh, 2.1 kilograms of heroin uh, with a street value of $1.7 million. And this came about by two reasons. An individual that made a, a report to the police department of something that did not appear right. Uh, and they didn't initially report uh, illegal drug dealing and the officer that responded to the call uh, did not know they were responding to a potential drug location. And so a citizen that said something when they saw something and a beat officer of this department, uh, when they arrived that said something is not right here and engaged all the apparatus of the Atlanta Police Department led uh, to the uh, removal of these drugs from the street before they could harm, led from the removal of these drugs from the street before they could be a catalyst for violence. Uh, and it allowed us to do our role in protecting uh, the streets of Atlanta. So I do wanna commend uh, the men and women of the department for that. The reason I have Mr. Freeman's picture up here is because uh, he, we have worked to have him turn himself in. Uh, we have uh, worked to take him into custody. He's not chosen to do so. So we've been publicizing uh, his name and his face uh, so we can, uh, and, and please call Crime Stoppers if you know where Mr. Freeman is at so we can take him into custody. I want to look uh, right now as at the end of the quarter where we were at on our recruitment initiatives this year, 127 uh, new officers, uh, future officers of the police department have been onboarded compared to 82 uh, this time last year. We just completed uh, recruitment drives in New York as well as Miami, but I'm always encouraged every other Thursday when I meet new officers coming to the city, how many we still see from the city of Atlanta that are choosing to serve their police department. And so please uh, continue to recommend constituents to the Atlanta Police Department. I also want to give a shout out to the officers that work the extra job at Lenox Mall. Uh, hardly a week goes by that not someone says I'm joining the police department because I was encouraged to do so uh, by an officer working at Lenox Mall. So we want to always have the talent coming to the Atlanta Police Department. 
joining and serving here, but if anyone has a heart of service, uh, we want you to consider the Atlanta Police Department. We train more, do more uh, than any other law enforcement agency in the state, and we we're encouraged by these numbers. We continue to, to work with the AU Center, Georgia State University, the airport, uh, and other, initiative, uh, other groups such as Lenox Mall, who hopes, uh, Lenox Square, who host uh, recruitment drives for us to continue to bring good men and women to the Atlanta Police Department. Obviously, we, we train for 35 weeks, and so we, we believe in qual uh, quality over quantity. I just want to give you a quick snapshot here of the number of officers in training, uh, which is 94 with the 45 uh, preparing to start very soon. Uh, we've already added this year 59 new officers to the field and we'll be having more joining very soon. Uh, we continue to have people return to the police department, which we're encouraged about, as well as, uh, as officers entering the lateral program. And always want to be appreciative of men and women uh, that are serving here. A couple things occurred during uh, the, the last quarter. A uh, couple little things, one called Dragon Con, where we actually had uh, individuals from all 50 states here in the city and states from around the globe that came to enjoy a weekend. That weekend, we also had Black Gay Pride. We had a number of sporting events in the city with not a single significant incident occurring in any of our sporting venues and our entertainment venues and where uh, individuals were coming to celebrate in our city. And it's always encouraged to see these events that are so iconically Atlanta and to be part of those, those efforts as uh, people are here. And then this, I think, is a very important screen to look at. During this quarter, we hosted the Peachtree Road Race, the world's largest 10K. I thought this was a great way just to show behind the scenes what is it at play to protect that event. When you have 126 traffic posts, 41 fortification posts, 42 heavy trucks, SWAT teams from seven jurisdictions that are staged strategically throughout uh, the location, our apex unit K-9 motors, our mounted patrol react teams, tactical field operators, uh, Georgia State patrol troopers as well as Fulton County Sheriff's deputies, our bomb squads, uh, our air assets that are, that are up to protect that iconically Atlanta event. And so to commend uh, everyone, we had 350 officers assigned to that detail alone and thank our partners at the law enforcement agencies that joined us from around the region. Thank the Department of Public Works for providing uh, the, the barricade trucks to protect that route. And we only had to look to what occurred in Illinois that day uh, to know where domestic terrorism may raise its head uh, at any time. And we pray that that does not befall our city, but should it arrive here. Please know that the men and women of the Atlanta Police Department are ready to quickly respond to such an occurrence. Um, and this overview here gives you some insight into what uh, was done to ensure that uh, this was a very safe day celebrating the independence of our country. And then I want to close with this. Uh, when we presented to you at the last quarterly meeting, you will see we had 3,760 cameras that were registered with Connect Atlanta, and we had 5,892 that were integrated. We're happy to say that we are now over the 10,000 mark for cameras that are integrated into Connect Atlanta and 5,957 that are registered. This is such a strong component of our abilities to provide for safe neighborhoods. It helps us find lost children. It helps us find uh, at-risk adults who may be lost. It helps us to quickly return property back to citizens that may have been stolen. It helps us to quickly uh, engage active shooters that are in the city. You name the emergency, this partnership with citizens that want to do their part uh, for the safety of Atlanta, citizens that are working closely with us as well as business owners to saying what we can do. If, you, if they ever ask you as an elected official what they can do, please say register and integrate your cameras. It is the 21st century uh, version of Neighborhood Watch, but we still want you to join Neighborhood Watch. Uh, but it's a great way that you can support uh, your doing this effort, public safety, is a team sport, it's just not the Atlanta Police Department alone, it is truly partnerships. It's many individuals that come uh, to work to make sure we have uh, the best city that we all know uh, that we're they're living in. Mr. Chairman, that's my report out for today. Certainly open for any questions that you or members of this committee may have. Thank you, Chief Shearbaum. Before we move to questions, I recognize we've been joined by Council Member Bond to my far right, and then Council Member Overstreet to currently my immediate left. Um, so. Colleagues, if you have questions for the chief, please indicate on your screen. First up is Councilmember Bond. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, uh, Chief Sherbond, for that 
very thorough uh, report and for the work that the men and women of APD have done uh, over the time since your last uh, appearance here. I just had a couple of questions. One, I want to compliment you on uh, the uh, gun buyback. I know that uh, there are literally thousands of guns that you all seize in the normal operations. And uh, can you expand on or expound on uh, the future of that program and how often you all may engage in uh, repeating that? It was very successful. And we know the mayor's office is looking for a very comprehensive and reoccurring way to continue to uh, contribute to the safety of their city. We anticipate one occurring again soon. Uh, I don't know exactly when that will be, uh, but the Atlanta Police Foundation is a strong partner and that is, has committed to continue to support it. So uh, once I know what the next date will be for that, Councilmember Bond will make sure you all are aware so you can help promote it through your communication avenues. And then as a tangent of that, I know that a, a place where most of these criminals are, get their weapons are from car break-ins. Uh, over, I guess, the last more than a decade, we've been pushing the clean car campaign, but it seems that some of these crimes are occurring, whether people have a, you know, have their groceries stacked in their car or if the car is completely empty. So what are the trends surrounding that? Well, we continue to see car break-ins where guns are taken at a, at a high rate. Uh, it, it was around 1,600, if I remember correctly so far this year. We'll make sure we provide uh, that number, so don't quote me on that till, till we can be totally sure. Uh, we've also seen some videos that would indicate individuals were breaking in the cars just looking for guns, uh, which is highly concerning. Some of those stolen guns do show up. When I talked about the drug houses that we have hit in the city, it is not uncommon to find stolen guns from car break-ins at those locations, which means it was probably used, uh, Councilmember Vaughn, as currency. Uh, to exchange for, for drugs. So it's, it's being used in some areas for that as well. Uh, we continue to encourage you, if you're carrying a weapon in your car, do as we require our officers to do, is to have a secure box uh, that you can place that weapon into. It can be accessible if you need it, uh, but cannot fall in wrong hands uh, because we do not want guns taken from uh, car break-ins to be able to be used in a crime anywhere else in the city. And then we just ask those that are operating parking decks in our city. This city is growing, and it's certainly growing up, uh, that if you have a parking deck in the city, you should invest in security guards, good lighting, license plate readers at the, at the beginning, uh, and uh, cameras, as well as the ability that individuals should not just go in and out of your parking deck on a 10-minute window or a 15-minute window. Those things there uh, that you would apply to your security plan will help curtail the number of car break-ins uh, that are occurring in Atlanta. Has there been any, you mentioned the, you triggered my, my thoughts when you mentioned the, the parking deck. Has there been any communication between APD and perhaps uh, the build, uh, Bureau of Buildings or even zoning about uh, requirements that we as a council may require some of these decks to have as preventive measures, you know, in the future? I'll make sure those are happening, Councilman Bond. I can't say for a fact that they are, but I'll make sure that we are passing on our observations uh, to the other city departments as well. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, I don't want to belabor it, but thank you very much for your uh, report and your service team. Thanks, sir. Next up, we have Camp Council Member Amos. Chief, how are you doing? Good afternoon, um, sir. But thank you. Um, just want to put a couple of um, addresses on, on your radar. Um, your men and women already have them, your majors already have them, but I, want, I don't want them to be new when they get to you. Okay. Thank you for listening to um, Mr. Green from Dixie Hills, because I mean, Dixie Hill, there's an ongoing issue there. But um, 2000 Chicago Avenue, 2000 Chicago and right at um, Illinois Avenue um, is an ongoing open air drug market. Um, have already given it to Major Mormon. Actually, the solicitor's office has it as well. But like I say, when it comes up in a COBRA meeting or a committee with you, I don't want it to be fresh so we can move forward. Also, I'm glad to hear you talk about the um, collaboration that we have with other law enforcement jurisdictions because you stay anywhere in my district. Not only do APD have jurisdiction, you're going to have probably MARTA, APS, PD, and others. And I, I think that needs to flow both ways especially when it comes to our institutional learning. Um, this weekend, and, and Major Mormon will never say it, so I said for him, Zone 1 was taxed this weekend. Um, you had the greatest high school in the world to have their homecoming, which was Washington High. 
and um, we made our annual pilgrimage to Washington Park and um, you know we had to um, do some enforcement over there but at the same time you had the spell house um, homecoming that was going on so that tax zone precinct zone resources and APD resources so it goes both ways so if, if you could talk to the chiefs there or, or the presidents there I mean um, the old Herndon Stadium Pascals and the um, parking deck that belongs to Clark Atlanta University behind BSB is an ongoing issue haven for crime haven for trash so if you could just spread that message um, I think one of our very own may still be over at Clark they came from APD so we can say things that necessarily you guys can't that our majors want but it is an ongoing issue that I would like to see resolved and if we have these partnerships they should go both ways and we should be able to serve the citizens of the city of Atlanta better so thank you you're welcome sir colleagues any other questions or comments President Shipman hello chief good to see you um, I just had uh, three quick topics one in looking at um, the weekly report not the quarterly report just notice that zone three and five are actually sort of against trend when it comes to violent crime I'm just curious if you could speak a little bit to efforts in in those particular zones uh, given what trend trend wise is a little bit of an outlier on the on the negative side yes sir we daily we review intelligence that's made available to us through a variety of resources um, many of which I can't speak about here uh, determine what may be motivating crime in certain areas uh, we see some that are domestic oriented uh, unique to that family unit or that a relationship unit in those particular cases we work to determine who else may be along that vein and connecting them with resources where we are specifically shifting resources into something that may be ge geography based where there's a certain intersection or a block that is having driving a pattern of crime and we will immerse resources in that area we are also looking to see if there's any disputes that are ongoing and if there are disputes that are occurring we work to break that up uh, either by uh, targeted arrest, uh, elevating uh, certain investigations to key areas. Uh, as it relates to Zone 5 and Zone 3, uh, there were some geographic patterns uh, that are emerging there that we have been targeting and putting additional resources in the area. Uh, the Fall Frontier initiative that we're rolling out uh, has a heavy presence in Zone 3 uh, in areas that we know that uh, um, deserves the attention of the, the Atlanta Police Department. So when it is geography based, you will see us putting resources in that area, maybe potentially moving camera trailers there, uh, looking at the lighting that may be in the area as well as the camera infrastructure to inform us. Uh, when it is being done by individuals or certain crime patterns, uh, we elevate those investigations, ensuring that's, that we know who we're looking for, uh, that those wanted notices are throughout the city, and that we use the, the entirety of the department's resources. So it's just not zone three uh, fighting crime, or uh, Councilman Mayor, it's just not zone one, because we did have other uh, departmental resources that were in the AU Center uh, this past weekend, ensuring the safety of the homecoming events, because we did have an incident the, re the week prior uh, at Clark Atlanta. Uh, so some of those will be related to individuals that we know um, need to be stopped in doing what they're doing, and others is a geographic pattern. Uh, but do know, uh, Council President Shipman, that every day we assess that. Uh, our, our crime is updated daily uh, as, as, as we get new police reports in and new intelligence. We have dashboards that we use to say where is the resources of the department needed today, and then we tweak that throughout the course of the week as needed. Um, just a just follow-up. Uh, Kind of an, a stat that jumped out to me that's not on the page numbers, but the weapons recovered year to date comparison. Zone five is the one zone that in which it, the weapons um, recovered is down. Um, I'm just that's just sort of a curious stat the given given that violent crime is up in, in that particular zone. Weapons recovered are down. So. Yes, sir. You will notice that they had a very strong year the, pre the year prior to that. Uh, a number that's very consistent with what is being recovered in the other zones today. Uh, we are obligated to go where probable cause takes us, and we are obligated to go uh, where the Constitution says you have the ability to seize guns. And when we we believe that daily and weekly we're deploying in the right areas and we make those adjustments sometimes you will see that drop because of uh, large events such as uh, the Peachtree Road Race uh, the Pride Parade you have others that puts a large concentration of officers in an area over time 
uh, where sometimes it displaces the criminal activity and the guns that may be readily available uh, for those officers. So I wish I could always tell you the why behind those statistical variances, uh, uh, President Shipman. I can't. I can tell you that looking at the efforts of the Zone 5 Command, uh, we know it's not for the lack of effort. Uh, and we will look at where we're deploying them, we can see us impacting uh, crime trends as occurring. So some of those may be just the number of drug operations that were identified in Zone 5 that were shut down. Uh, there's other variables that determine why there's those seizures may be off from the other zones. Um, different topic quickly, the Training Academy report and the overall recruiting report. Um, obviously, year over year, looks like we're making good progress. I know uh, how big of a, of a focus that is for everybody. Could you just help me as, on the Training Academy report, which of the numbers should we add together to sort of understand, we've, we've had a, a notion of 250 new officers, right? That's sort of been out in the public's mind. I get asked a lot about it, my colleagues do as well. If you, if you just look at that, we've got 144 total recruits, we've got the rehires, the laterals. Do we also add to that the 59 officers, or is that, or is that duplicative? I'm just trying to understand that. Yeah, so those in training, well, some of them will have been hired last year. Okay. And, and I know um, Mr. Amon can also give more detail to this. If you look at the total numbers that are in the pipeline, meaning they're at the end of the phase or they're waiting for uh, their psychological or they're waiting for the final fingerprinting, those numbers are right at 229. Okay. Uh, so here we are entering the third quarter. Uh, we, we know 250 is our goal. We're, gonna, we're, we're pushing hard for 250. Uh, so people hired in 2021 will still be moving through some phases of training depending on when they when they were well, that's hired. fair but that's right. that's the number that's the number that I was looking yes, sir. for yes, we're against 250 and just if you could comment and, and if you want to bring the data back I'm just curious how retention is this year versus last year because obviously there's the how many people come in and then there's the overall net to the overall force um, it, a comment on that would be helpful yes very very close we continue to see neighboring jurisdictions desire to hire Atlanta police officers. And we're combating that. And you, what you see is new jurisdictions still forming that weren't here a year ago. And I look only to Stockbridge uh, that is looking. So we still have individuals uh, that, are, that are going to other agencies. Some people will retire uh, because we're, we're a large department, you have that. So it's still about, uh, about the same as it was last year. We're still holding our own in that space. But what we're encouraged by is initiatives coming from the mayor's office to support the men and women of the Atlanta Police Department. We revamped in June our exit interview process, which we believe gives us much better insight as to why individuals uh, are, are leaving to go to other agencies. Um, some determine they want to enter the private sector. Those strategies are a little bit different, uh, President Shipman, but the ones we want to be successful in is when individuals go to other agencies. And I'm very encouraged by the strategies we're laying uh, out around facilities. Uh, proper precincts, training facilities, cars, take-home cars, uh, as well as conversations around benefits. Uh, but we must keep in mind, in 2026, we, ho we host the World Cup. 2025, uh, we host uh, the college football championship game. And I'm an optimist. Uh, I believe in 2024, we may just be ho hosting a cornerstone of American democracy. Uh, and to do that, we need men and women in the Atlanta Police Department. And so working with the administration uh, and their full support of retention and hiring, because as we grow the police department back, if we're doing 10 things, six of them have to be keeping the men and women that we have. And so everything that can be done to give them the equipment they need, give them uh, the compensation that they deserve, as well as the benefits to make us competitive. Uh, I see that as something that the administration uh, is prioritizing, and I, I see that in our regular communications, and I'm encouraged about it. So we can get you specific numbers for that, Councilman uh, Shipman, but we need to be doing better in that area as the neighboring jurisdictions become just as competitive as, the, as we are because they're in the same boat, right? Well, I appreciate all of your efforts in the men and women of the police force. Thank you. Colleagues, any other questions? Our chief, I have a few questions. Um, just want to see if there are any updates. Uh, I know this has been brought up a few times that are bi-weekly reports. You know, one of the top issues right now I hear about from people in the city and my constituents is our 911 hold times. Uh, so I wanted to see if you or Mr. Amon had any updates on the new technology that's been previously talked about that's hopefully going to help that. Um, you know, we have people calling in to report what they at least perceive to be violent crime. And then on the flip side, we have, you know, I know you all have been putting out the, you don't call 911 for this, uh, Instagram videos or uh, audio recordings. 
Um, so what, what are we doing to combat that? And just an update on that technology rollout, please. Yes, sir. I'll let Mr. Amon speak to that because we do have a number of initiatives underway to Im improve uh, our answer times from staffing, technology, and then education. So if you could please uh, repost any of our social media about when you should and shouldn't call 911, uh, that would be helpful. Peter Amon, Chief Administrative Officer, Atlanta Police Department. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm going to let the director of the 911 Center and the deputy director talk in a minute about the Viper 7 phone upgrade, and we'll, we actually have a, a helpful handout, uh, which I will uh, have them provide you as well, and we'll be posting. Uh, but just in brief, as I uh, may have said last time, but I think it bears uh, repeating, that uh, two things can be true at once. Uh, the first is that we have an incredibly dedicated group of folks uh, working in the emergency 911 center right now as we speak. And in fact, if you go over there, you'll see channel 26 often displayed on the TVs. So I, I want them to, to hear me if they happen to be at least watching, uh, which is we owe them all a debt of gratitude. They do an incredibly difficult job day after day, 24 hours a day. The second thing that is simultaneously true uh, is that we are not happy with our 911 answer times. Uh, we believe that they are significantly below benchmark and our aspirations. Uh, that is primarily due to staffing. Um, we have uh, many more vacancies open now than uh, we would like and than we have had uh, previously, or at least than we had this time last year. Uh, so we have significantly ramped up hiring. Um, in addition to that, uh, we are cross-training uh, people from our real-time crime center. Uh, in fact, this morning at 9 a.m., uh, we had six members of our real-time crime center, uh, previously known as the Video Integration Center, uh, begin cross-training to do dispatch. So we're going to bring six people in for surge support. If there is an urgent need in the real-time crime center, as you know, it's right across uh, the glass wall from the 911 center. So we're augmenting staffing in an emergency way to do that. Um, and we have, as I said, a lot of efforts ongoing on hiring. But uh, by far the most important uh, immediate thing, in addition to staffing, in addition to hiring and, and transferring staff, is the implementation of Viper 7, uh, which will allow us to place non-emergency calls on hold. So I'm going to bring up the director and deputy director to talk about the specifics, but the, the, the real simple version is if you call because you lost your glasses, you will, you will hit a live person, but then you will be put on hold until such time and given options for other means of assistance uh, than our emergency services. So I'm going to turn it over to Director Arnold and Deputy Director Solis. Thank you. Good afternoon, Deputy, De Deputy Director Solis. Um, I'm essentially here just to field any questions that you guys may have about Viper 7. I know that we've spoken before about it. Um, essentially, it's um, in layman terms, as easy as switching from your iPhone 13 to your iPhone 14. It is an upgrade, but it does come with some benefits and rewards for us that we're excited about. From the user perspective, the 911 operator perspective, not a lot has changed. Um, what has changed is a lot of what's going on in the background. We've talked about queues, we've talked about 911 queues and non-emergency queues, but as we get closer to our cutoff date, uh, cutover date, which is November 2nd and 3rd, um, I thought I would take an opportunity um, just to let you guys know we have eight queues in the live environment. Um, some questions came up last time about how are we going to handle transfers from other jurisdictions and make sure the priority on those was weighted equally and given the service and attention that it needed. Um, what that is is eight queues as opposed to the two that we talk about in a lot of our um, public programming for, for effort and ease of understanding. So we've got queues for 911 calls that come in as abandoned. Abandoned to us means somebody who pocket dialed us and disconnected or somebody who was not able to complete the phone call and disconnected because of an emergency, a variable of things. Uh, we weight the abandons differently than the 911s, different than a non-emergency from another agency versus a non-emergency from a citizen, all the way down to alarm companies. And then we've even created a queue um, in our training environment so that as we train new employees, they're better able to understand how the queue operates, how the Force Connect operates. Um, but again, that's just the, the broad overview, and I'm happy to, to field any questions that you guys may have. So what did you say the rollout date was, November? November 2nd, we'll go live with the phone calls. November 3rd, we'll go live with the text messages. So the 2nd and 3rd, we'll have all of our vendor staff on site for that rollout. And then just following up with, uh, you mentioned the quadruple six number and, you know, how it kind of uses a non-emergency number. How, however, as I brought up last time, it was put out to our neighborhood years ago uh, because uh, 
we border Cobb County, so a lot of the times they would get the Cobb County Tower, would right. say, well, I'm in Atlanta, and then they would transfer you to Fulton County, and they'd be like, well, I was asking for Atlanta, right. not Fulton County. So, you know, two yeah. minutes later, you finally get transferred to um, Atlanta 911. So how will, how will this system change for people that, like for my cell phone, if I'm out of my district, you know, I just hit 911, and the quadruple six number is the first one that comes out, and I just dial that number, because otherwise I'm going to get cops who want to pick up. Sure. So what I would recommend with this is, one, we want to pr promote that 10-digit, the 6666 for the non-emergency pieces. Um, but we also want to recognize that if you do live on the fringes of our jurisdiction, and depending on cell capacity and whatnot, you get another jurisdiction. You do just need to go ahead and be mindful of what their announcement and what their greeting says and say, I need Atlanta 911. You would then be transferred back into us. And it does recognize the system is intuitive enough to recognize that you dialed a three digit number and that they're transferring a three digit number into our new and upgraded system. It will put you at the front of the line. Um, also, if you called them for whatever reason, through a non-emergency number because you assumed that you were up in Smyrna for the incident, you determined that you're south of Smyrna and you need us, they can transfer you back in on a backdoor line that we are not making public that is prioritized higher than our 10-digit public lines. Because the assumption is that if you're calling and being transferred from another PSAP or 911 center, um, that there may be more urgency to your call. And so we treat that, that's where the queues get broken down even, even more so than just two into eight. So it would be prioritized higher than just a public facing number. Thanks for that. And can we get like this, maybe not labeled talking points, but kind of get this information in either a PDF or a JPEG so we can push it out to the public? Yeah, absolutely. We have a, a PDF of this already and I'm sure Director Arnold and myself can get that to you as soon as the meeting's over. Uh, colleagues, any 911 specific questions while we have the 911? Director up, assistant director. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you guys. Uh, Councilmember Overstreet. Yeah, that's what I just asked for. She's going to send it to us. Yeah. Uh, ch Chief, um, what is uh, an update on zone and beat realignment? Study? Can, yes, underway. Uh, I hope to have something uh, latter part of this month, first part of next month of the latest rendition. The team is going back. As you know, we engaged Georgia Tech to assist us with that. So it is progressing, and we hope to have something soon uh, that we're finalizing to be able to show the community. Great. Um, I had asked previously, and I, I know some of this is on, probably on the police foundation, but uh, can we get out to council members some updated uh, camera and LPR maps, as well as any uh, cameras that may be down, right. so we can uh, work on resolving those. Because you know, that's, that's one of the uh, public commenters mentioned. You know, this is these are vital and help you know solve crime. You know, I have a camera and you know it's probably half a mile from my house that helps solve a murder in 24 to 36 hours. But then on the flip side of that, we don't want to get into a situation where, you know, a violent crime occurs and then we find out later that, you know, the camera's down and had been down for six months uh, without any uh, resolve. So if we could get that map okay. and list uh, either from APD or APF. Um, what is our current uh, number of sworn officers that we have? Be right at 1,500, council member, and then approximately the 140 some recruits that you have in training. So is that right around 1,500 counting those recruits? No, or not sir. Counting those no. recruits. It's right at 1,500 sworn, 100 and some in veteran training. Is it the the 144 number that's on our slide? Yes, sir. That's the current. Recruit. That would be an addition to. <clears throat> um, and much to kind of working off some of Councilmember Ramos' questions. You know, and I know this is a, it's a numbers game and we can only work with what we've got, but what, what is the plan to get our field operations division more resources that it very, very sorely needs? Um, you know, we, I think the maximum number of beats uh, some zones have are 14 and sometimes those are uh, missing 
I would say, a number of officers. Um, and you know, what, what we have went out and said, you know, police op one police officer beat is an area one police officer should patrol, and sometimes they're tasked with, you know, two, at least two beats to patrol. Um, and, you know, that, that shows, and those are the complaints that we get from our constituents. You know, that starts out with holding on 911 for, you know, 10, 20 minutes, and then they, and, you know, officers are off dealing, they're, it's not like they're do, not doing anything, they're off right. dealing with other calls and other higher priority calls on the prioritization list, but um, that is the public, the most public facing part of APD, you know, when people are calling 911 and, you know, possibly some of the worst times of their life, they need to get a hold of 911 and they need an officer uh, that is, you know, not tied up uh, to show up quickly. And, um, you know, that boils down to getting as many resources as we can into field operations uh, and out to our zone. So what is, what is the plan for that? Yes, sir. It's the classes that you see currently in the academy. Uh, as they come out, they will be assigned to zones based on the latest information we have to know where the most pressing need are. Uh, the plan is ensuring that we continue to build up other units not at the expense of field operations. We do it very smartly. Uh, work, we can use uh, civilian team members. We will be work. We can move out of current administrative positions to crime fighting uh, is, is on the table. And to make sure that we're using the, current, the right model uh, to serve the citizens of Atlanta. So everything's on the table that would be part the, be able to determine where these resources go. While we are uh, officers, hundreds of officers short, we're still the largest police department in the state. More people wear this uniform than wear uniforms of the Georgia State Patrol. So keep that in mind. So our job is to take the entirety of the Atlanta Police Department, civilian and sworn, uh, in all of our divisions and deploy them in a manner, uh, Council Member Hillis, that we actually reduce the number of 911 crimes occurring because we're putting the right people in jail. Uh, and we deploy resources from our community services division so they're in the right places to prevent crime as well. Uh, so you give support to field operations by ensuring the rest of the department is aligned in a manner that decreases the number of 911 calls, takes off things off the plate of field operations that we can, and shift resources as, as are needed throughout the police department. Right. And um, some questions, I'll just say a, a number of us had a a great time at the Crime is Toast breakfast, always a great event where, you know, a number of APD officers and leaders were recognized, but, you know, as you said in your speech there that, you know, it's, it's all of the Atlanta Police Department that uh, makes the city work and they all deserve, you know, applause and recognition. So just thank them from recruit all the way up to you. Uh, thank you for the work y'all do day in and day out. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Yeah. Take care. Next presentation we have is the solicitor's office. I have Solicitor Carter. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chairman Hillis, President Shipman, and all members of the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee. I am Raines Carter, City Solicitor, and as always, I'm very happy to present our quarterly report to you today. I am joined today by two of my deputy solicitors, Deputy Solicitor Erica Smith and Deputy Solicitor Andrew Taylor, and they will give me assistance where needed. I want to go straight into a critical issue that we've been dealing with lately, and that is the street racing issue. As you know, uh, we're dealing with high intensity traffic in the city of Atlanta Municipal Court because we have concurrent jurisdiction over the state offenses that are related to racing as well as our own city ordinances. Uh, we will also get an update today related to our nuisance properties initiatives and we will give you an update on our community outreach activities. As you all remember, and thank you so much, uh, we had an ordinance that was successfully passed and signed by the mayor that deals with that non-driver participation in street racing. It is reflective of what we have been undergoing as a nation. In many of our major cities, and now in many of our mid-sized communities, especially along the Northern Arc, we're having a serious problem with these events. 
that are being organized, that are being driven by social media uh, as uh, uh, entertainment. And these things are causing a tremendous amount of danger. Uh, we see on our news reports almost daily about people that are losing their lives to what I term as senseless exhibitionism. So thank you for putting this ordinance in place because this ordinance also deals with participants who are normally present at these events, who are promoting the events, and for people who are bystanders who themselves are in danger when we have a situation where these vehicles can get out of control. And we will be working with you to try to further refine our ordinances. We will be coming forward with some recommendations uh, as you go into your next legislative cycle based on what we're seeing in the court system. So please stay tuned. We'll be coming to you with some recommendations for further amendments. The seven most common charges that are associated with street racing, of course, is the offense of racing itself, speeding. Of course, we've had our super speeder laws on the books for a while, reckless driving, and laying drag. But the last two are the ones that I want to elaborate on today, and that's fleeing and attempting to elude, which is a state offense and a new offense that has been put in place by the Georgia General Assembly related to reckless stunt driving, or what I call the fast and furious effect. We have been looking at too many movies. If you take a look at what has taken place in terms of, of updates, um, my hat's off to the legislature and with the support you all gave for them to revise certain offenses where misdemeanors have now been elevated to the felony level. And this is a very important tool for APD, Georgia State Patrol, and our other partners to have significant impact on these offenders, especially the repeat offenders. So if these activities are taking place where people are basically driving along over on sidewalks just to get by or just to get through traffic, um, passing school buses, putting our children in danger, uh, of course, laying drag and reckless driving. Well, reckless stunt driving, which I'll elaborate on a little more, has now been added to that felony list, as well as upgrades from DUI offenses. And then a fourth offense of fleeing and eluding in the state of Georgia is now automatically a felon, as well as fleeing and eluding where it results in an, an accident. We um, may recall a very sad story a couple of years ago of a young lady and her daughter exiting a, a ramp from one of our interstates and was hit and killed by one of these drivers. So we want you to understand that we are taking this seriously. Uh, we are working in a very strong fashion to make sure that we enforce these penalties. Let's take a look at the penalties. Under the new law, the range of penalties have increased. A first conviction is 30 days in jail and up to 12 months. And what I want you to understand about what you're seeing with these penalties is this is not an or, this is an. So what that means is 30 days and a fine, 90 days and a fine, 180 days and a fine. And then a fourth conviction with felonies can go range up from one to 10 years. And of course you see the fine amounts there. So this is an update as we in the state of Georgia and our subsequent jurisdictions all over the world take a look at how dangerous this is becoming for our citizens. We now have an additional offense that was added by the General Assembly regarding reckless stunt driving. Uh, it's created by people who are drag racing, laying drag, doing the, the donuts and the circles and those types of things, 
because it's in reckless disregard for not only their own safety, but the safety of anybody in the vicinity. What's important about this is that this applies whether on the public highways, but guess what? It also applies when it's conducted on private property without the express authorization of the owner of some property. So it can be public or private property. As you can see, the penalties that are associated with this particular offense, uh, a very first conviction is a minimum 10 days in jail. Second goes up to 90 days and so forth and so on to a felony conviction for a fourth offense. Related to this new offense regarding stop driving, the legislature has provided that this can come under our state forfeiture provisions. We are always seeking new ways to really get at this issue. I have been able to have conversations with the, uh, with the administration and with APD so that we can explore ideas about forfeiture of vehicles because once you touch the instrumentalities of this offense, that's how you really get people's attention. Uh, you can have a convicted person that's unlicensed, but what do they do? They'll go out and just drive illegally. So if we can come up with better strategies and ideas relating to forfeiture, uh, we want to also work on some ideas and submit that for the administration's consideration and your consideration with regard to our next upcoming legislative session. Uh, subsection two is very interesting because even at the state level, they are now taking a look at the forfeiture, but if it is the only vehicle in the family, they authorize mitigation for the use of that vehicle by a family member. So these are things that we need to keep refining as, as we move forward in this fast and furious world that we're all suffering with. And we want to keep, uh, keep us safe, everybody safe. Now, um, I am available for the rest of the presentation for specific questions. Um, Mr. Taylor is also available. Uh, what I would like to do now is to turn over the remainder of the presentation to Deputy Solicitor Erica Smith in order to give you an update on nuisance properties. And as always, thank you very much for your attention and thank you very much for your support. Good afternoon, Erica D. Smith, Deputy Solicitor. Um, I want to give you an update on where we are with our nuisance properties and give you an update on uh, the, the properties that we're uh, about to file on. First of all, we, begin, we still uh, work with our administration and our various city departments now on a monthly basis to engage in meetings about our problem residential, multifamily, and commercial properties throughout the city of Atlanta. One of the things that uh, happened during this quarter is that one of our uh, cases that we brought before municipal court was uh, appealed in Superior Court. And the Superior Court said that, um, that the evidence was overwhelming in the lower court, which is municipal court, and actually upheld the ruling. Now, this particular property, it wasn't declared a nuisance. The property wasn't declared a nuisance, but the operation of how the uh, property was being operated, the hours of operation were a 24 hours. And so what the judge did was narrowed those hours of operation so that the hours where there were a lot of violent crime, that the business was to close at 11.59 and not open up again until 5.30 a.m. So that is good news for us because uh, where we're going with our nuisance property initiative is uncharted waters. When we look for case law, there is none because no one is doing anything in Georgia how we're doing it on these uh, residential, multifamily, and commercial properties. So again, this is good news for us because a higher court has indicated what we're doing here in municipal court uh, is the right thing to do. Also, before the end of the year, we're set to file two more uh, actions against two multifamily pro properties. These are part complexes that we're getting ready to move on. Uh, many times people ask me, what's the difference between 
nuisance and in rim aren't they the same actually they are not uh, our nuisance properties um, and nuisance actions are derived from our uh, title 41 within the state code and that says that in order to be a nuisance, it has to be something hurtful, inconvenience, and damage another. The fact that uh, that is otherwise lawful shall not keep it from being a nuisance. You can have a party at your house, okay? You can have a house party. There's nothing against that. However, you cannot change the dynamics of the neighborhood with parking, and you cannot use your home as a commercial venue. You cannot throw those parties every single weekend and have weddings every single weekend and so on and so forth and renting your house out. Having a party is not unlawful, but renting your house out and going against our zoning regulations is. Also, as a public nuisance, which is something that we bring before our uh, municipal court, is one that damages all persons who come within the sphere of the operation of whatever you're doing. And, and it can't not be uh, fanciful and that it has an effect on individuals. I'll give you an example of this, okay? If I'm coming to your convenience store and I'm just an average ordinary person wanting to buy some chips, but your particular location is known for violent activity, well, shots fired, uh, shootouts and things of that nature, then you're rising to a public nuisance because even though I'm just going into the store to get a bag of chips, I may be engaged into being a victim of a crime. So therefore, under UCA, UCGA uh, section 41.2 and 1 through 41.2.5, those actions under the state uh, uh, under the state code can be brought before municipal court or superior court. We have brought nuisance action just going straight to superior court. We're asking where we ask for certain businesses to be closed immediately. And uh, on that note, both of those uh, uh, actions were granted in superior court, but we do have the ability to bring those cases in superior court, I mean, in uh, municipal court. But however, a like, like I just mentioned, or brought before Superior Court. We have codified uh, within Title V in Section 74-175 crime-based nuisances and other things that are, that are to be declared a nuisance within municipal court. Those things are not just crime alone, but we look at obnoxious get, um, uh, pollution of water, wells, cisterns, pits, holes, obnoxious gas and odors, buildings used to sell or dispose of illegal controlled substances, the crack houses, the trap houses, those houses that you have a lot of drug activity. And uh, Councilmember Amos, I did Amos, I did talk with Mr. Green to get a listing of those properties because those properties can be declared a nuisance. We also work with our partners, the DA's office, because even though um, uh, felonies are not within our wheelhouse. If something happened at your uh, particular property address and it is a felony, we turn to our partners in the DA's office to see what happened because certain things are nuisance per se, such as drugs. That's a nuisance per se if you have a certain amount of convictions at uh, your particular location. In the DA's office, they will give the owners a, a letter and put them on notice that it is a nuisance per se. So we still, we do work with uh, our partners in some of these cases to see what happens with them. Also, an unclean vacant lot, junk vehicles, graffiti, and violent crime in and of itself can be declared a nuisance. But I want to go through what we have available through our, our city ordinance under 74-75 that if your property is declared a nuisance under this particular section uh, for crime, we look at the type of crime. And also the remedies for that is that you have to implement security measures, whether that is to integrate into a, a connect Atlanta, get additional security guards for your property address, or if you know or have reason to know who is bringing certain crimes or who are uh, engaged in certain crimes, this particular code section uh, puts the onus on the owner to actually evict those persons from their property address if it is a single family residence and you're renting it out or in multifamily uh, uh, locations. It gives them the ability to um, dispossess those people. Also within that code section, we have the ability to enjoin 
enjoin is like a TRO, a temporary restraining order, where we close you to stop that particular activity that is being engaged in in your property address. However, most importantly, before we start with this type of action, the owner must be put on notice. Just like I just said with the DA's office, if something is a nuisance per se, the DA's office gives them a letter, like a sister to cease type of letter, and puts them on notice. So you're on notice of what's going on at your property address. What are you gonna do? You have to implement these remedies. If you do not, we move towards an action and we get an order. And if you do not abide by that order, you can be fined and uh, up to $1,000 for that particular offense. Not only are we prosecutors, but we always are public servants here for the city of Atlanta. And we have engaged in our community working together for One Atlanta. And I wanna go now over our community outreach and uh, community prosecution. Many of our partnerships involve several of you who are sitting before me. Uh, we had seven events in July uh, with food distribution and safety and community events, as well as in August and September. And I'm gonna get into those particular uh, events and activities that we participated in within this quarter. On July 30th, we had a book bag giveaway with maximum impact to uh, give out book bags as well as school, school supplies for kids that were going back to school in, with Atlanta Public Schools. On August 10th, uh, we partnered with Councilmember Bond and the full County Commissioner, Natalie Hall, for food distribution at uh, the Darnell Center on Fairburn Road. September 14th, uh, we uh, participated again with Councilmember Bond for HelloFresh Conference. September 21st and 22nd, we participated in food drives at Pittman Park and at Jackson Memorial Baptist Church. In this quarter, we had two of our senior citizen public safety events. We actually had one in District 9, Zone 1, on September 23rd. That was our fifth public safety event to let our seniors know how to implement uh, safety procedures as well as to protect themselves uh, in, the, in the space in which they're living in. October 7th, we celebrated our sixth senior citizen public safety event in Zone 2 at St. Philip's, uh, Phillips Cathedral. In this quarter, we also continued with our college uh, campus safety events. On, in August, we were at Clark Atlanta. In September, we went to Georgia State. And October 6th, we were at Emory to let the students know about um, how laws in the state of Georgia may be different than in your home state. For an example, if you're stopped within the city of Atlanta and you receive a parking ticket, parking, not, I'm sorry, not parking, but a moving violation ticket, a traffic ticket, moving violations in the state of Georgia are criminal misdemeanors. And if you do not attend court, you miss your court date, a warrant could be put out for your arrest and your license can be suspended in your home state. So we just let students know at all our colleges and universities that you may come from Massachusetts, but if you get a ticket, in Atlanta, Georgia, then you need to come to court and take care of your, uh, your ticket. But we also let them know that in our office, we do have diversion programs, such as pretrial diversion traffic, that if it's, if it's your first offense within a year, then, uh, then your, uh, your case and your citation can go through the diversion program. August 2nd was National Night Out, and National Night Out has grown from just a crime prevention program and a partnership with the police department in our communities. It's actually now like a homecoming. Because of the pandemic, as many uh, uh, organizations and groups and persons that I don't normally see because our MPU meetings and many of the meetings that we uh, participate in are virtual, but you actually get to see the people up close and, and in person. So it's really like a homecoming, like, oh, I haven't seen you in so long. And it's really good to get out, eat some good food and see people that we haven't seen in some time. None of the things that we do would not be possible without our partners. And our partners are council members as well as our outside agency, APD, the fire department, our colleges and our universities, um, the Atlanta Police Foundation. We are happy to engage and roll up our sleeves and get out there in public. So whether it's fight against blight in action where we're participating in street cleanups or any type of community cleanup, the solicitor's office is here, not just to prosecute, but to be public servants and to help our community and be 
a partner within our communities. And at this time, if you have any questions for me or Mr. Carter, we'll be well, happy to answer them. Thank you, Solicitor Carter. Deputy Solicitor Smith. Colleague, questions, please indicate on your speaker button. Uh, first up is Councilmember Overstreet. Hello, both of you. Thank you so much for coming uh, to present to us today. Um, I am still very concerned about our nuisance properties and the way that we're handling um, the actual end game, what we're trying to accomplish. I just feel like I'm, I've been on a treadmill trying to uh, accomplish some things with uh, some nuisance, nuisance properties or um, code enforcement, blatant, blatant um, ordinance violations um, and I just really would like to see um, what else we can do. I know that the many have been fined a thousand dollars. Is it time for us to change that amount? Like, do we need to legislate that? Um, you know, I just want to, you know, see movement, a little more movement. Well, for us, um, the end game, it depends on the property, and that's the difference between nuisance and in rim. If it's an in rim action, uh, that's dealing with the structure itself, the dilapidation of the structure, or if you have a burned out building, something of that nature, we want to have the city, the authority to get up on that property and remove the blight if the owner does not do it. So that's the end game with the in rim action. With the nuisance, it's crime. Usually something is, uh, pushing it to be a nuisance. And uh, for the most parts in the cases that I've handled and that's been through uh, municipal court and superior court, the crime was the catalyst. And so we want to eliminate or alleviate the crime that is coming from a particular address. Now, that's not to say that something is solely a nuisance action or solely an in rim action. Right. Sometimes you have both of them going at the same time, especially with some of our multifamily properties. You do have structural damage at that particular property, but you also have an overlay of crime as well. And I, I, I've heard you, I, uh, and um, Ms. Talley was here, and if I, I want to speak with you offline on some, some of the issues that you presented, and uh, I apologize again that um, I wasn't able to make the meeting that you had, but I do have an update for you on some of the properties that are within your district and how we're moving forward with that. Okay. Looking forward to hearing those updates, but uh, I do believe that it, for one example, 3131 Campbellton is both. Um, we have documented um, evidence of several police raids being done there, and they've been boarded since I've been on council. So that is that the shopping plaza? It is. Okay. And you know, the early learning across the street. Um, it has been burned out several times and it's just boarded and has been since I've been on council. And I just wanna, and those are just a couple of the actual um, issues that I've been discussing, but I just wanna see a little more movement. And I do, I, I will work to get you back on the calendar again because um, something's happened a couple times and I just really do want us to sit down and go over my list again. Council Member Overstreet, I also want to add that we are in the process of expanding our toolbox. Uh, we had an opportunity to meet with APD. We are engaging our federal partners, okay. um, U.S. Attorney Brooke Cannon's office, and we have contacts that have been brought to our attention. Um, some of you may remember uh, Project Safe Neighborhoods which did a lot in uh, Council District 3. We want to sit down and have a meeting with you about engaging our federal partners. We have some additional tools that have been brought to our attention that can stop this treadmill effect and get a final conclusion to whether or not these properties are going to continue to operate or exist. And we're very excited about it, and we want to meet with you offline about it. That's wonderful. Um, and so I, I am all about being fair, you know, with the investors or the developers or, or the landowners. But sometimes you, we're like, I truly believe we're dealing with those that just don't care about what's happening in the community because they don't live 
by my by 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 where they their property is located um and i just feel that you know there's some more things that can be done so that's really uh good news and i am going to reschedule us again so that we can sit down as soon as possible thank you council member bond thank you mr chair and and uh thank you uh for your presentation today and uh, Mr. Carter, I'm really excited about what you're saying about street racing. Uh, I know that uh, over the last couple of years, if you have not been directly impacted by it, people say, well, what, what's the big deal? You know, these kids are burning off steam, and it is a highly dangerous enterprise that, I mean, it, it, it has cost people's lives. One of my close friends, uh, Jada Sanford lost her life, and, the, and, and part of the law that you mentioned was passed in her memory. Uh, she was killed on her own street uh, by a street racer. So I'm really pleased to, to hear that there will be stronger enforcement uh, on that and that there, 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 there are stronger things that we can do uh, to keep our, our streets and the, the persons who are using them, whether they're in a car or on the sidewalk, safe. I know in the center of the city, in the midtown area, for the last uh, two and a half years, that seems to be top of mind, you know, because of the uh, recklessness that whether they're in a car or SUV or ATV or wh whatever it is uh, on our streets. So I'm really excited about that. And I also wanted to take uh, just a moment to thank you all for supplying us with the volunteers that you do every week on hello uh, at, at hello fresh so it's every wednesday almost without fail uh, that you've extended your staff in that volunteer uh effort and so i wanted to, you know again thank you and salute the members of your staff that you send uh to aid us so i really deeply appreciate it council member bond it is our uh absolute prep uh, pleasure and with regard to the street racing issue, if we take a two-prong approach in the state of Georgia and looking at what other jurisdictions are doing, yes, we deal with the offender in a very significant way, but as we start looking at utilizing other types of tools like forfeiture, if we sit down and put our heads together with our state and county leaders to start looking at how we impact the vehicles themselves as instrumentalities and consider those vehicles to be contraband, I think we'll start seeing a difference. So no, we don't I, want to say everything right now, but right. we need to think along those lines. No, I agree with you, and I'm, I'm so long in the tooth here. I remember we did that with the Johns down on what was then <laughs> Stewart Avenue. Now it's... Uh, met, now it's a new day, so it's Metropolitan Parkway now. But uh, when we began to take the cars from the Johns, we saw a real difference in the prostitution that was going on down there. So I think it's a fabulous idea, and looking forward to hearing more about it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Boone. Hello, Mr. Carter. Thank you all so much for um, what you do um, in your space, particularly at the midnight basketball game, you all have not missed a game, and we really, really appreciate your staff being there, giving our citizens information, um, and just the overall responsiveness. When our seniors are having issues with the courts, you all have taken the time, and that was mentioned in one of our community meetings in the Baker Hills community, so thank you all so much. We are looking at the house with the umbrellas on Baker's Ferry Road. Mm -hmm. And just if you would provide us with some type of, um, Ms. Smith, are you familiar with that home with the umbrellas and the party constantly in the front yard? <laughs> yes, Council Member Boone. And I can give you an update on, on that property. It's actually not just one, but it's three particular properties. Thank you very much. Any other colleagues or questions? President Shipman. It's actually probably for Chief Peak. Um, Chief, I was wondering if you could just comment a little bit on, obviously, the 
this is a uh, street racing is an issue that APD has to deal with first before it gets to the solicitor's office. Could you just talk a little bit about what you're seeing and and uh, the kinds of resources that you have or that you need to continue to combat street racing? Sure. Yes. Absolutely. And. Uh, certainly good afternoon to all council, state council members. Uh, as we look at street racing, um, I'll speak at a high level of what we're doing really and truly on the front end to combat it. So what we recognize is it's not an issue specific to Atlanta, but for our area of responsibility. Uh, there's an intel group that we'll always uh, work alongside communicating with each surrounding jurisdiction to get information. Uh, what we're seeing is ultimately they're utilizing a number of platforms to try to really and truly get around law enforcement's response. Um, they are coming in great numbers and so what will happen with that is we've uh, notified all of our personnel that when we get those calls, what well, first thing we did was elevated the uh, priority through our 911 system. Once upon a time, it was at a lower priority, so we've moved that up to a priority two, if I'm not mistaken, to where it's an immediate response. Uh, supervisors and officers, regardless who it is, they are mandated to immediately respond to those locations to get a quick response. What we're finding is there are some individuals that have been pretty violent in those situations. We have made a number of great arrests here recently. Uh, we've impounded some vehicles. We've placed a couple people in jail for the uh, participation more so, as well as the actual uh, driving of the vehicles themselves. So we have a robust plan, but it takes a lot of work to really and truly corral those resources to get in there and deal with those issues. Um, the recommendation that I know we had quite some time ago about the ability to seize those vehicles were where we were going earlier, so certainly looking forward to continuing to work through that process so that we can successfully start removing those vehicles and holding them contraband as evidence and you don't get it back until we've resolved the case. And so that's, that's the way that we certainly would like to go to continue to uh, fight it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Peek. Um, Sister Carter had a few questions. Um, you spoke about, or Deputy Solicitor Smith spoke about uh, some appeals to uh, Superior Court uh, by defendants. However, how many unsuccessful, at least to the city, cases have we had any municipal court so far? And then when that happens, can a city also appeal to Superior Court or do we have to file a new case with the Superior Court? No, we do not. We can actually appeal. Uh, we can actually go to appeal, okay, and, uh, and appeal anything that's adverse to the city. And right now, as we stand, we've had kind of like a split on, on certain, but uh, we've had had um, one where we were ruled against the municipal court, and we just got that recently, and the city actually has 30 days in order to appeal, and so we're doing an analysis of that particular case to know the direction in which uh, we will go as the city in the solicitor's office. I remember that case, I'm also familiar with the one in my district uh, there at, and it was a few years ago, but Hollowell and North Eugenia. Okay. That on that one, I will speak with you offline. We're bringing that one back. There was some uh, evidentiary issues on that particular case, as well as the notice requirement. That so was brought to municipal. Or? That that was brought to municipal, but we're bringing that one back. That we're not appealing the decision on that case, but we're just going to bring it back because the uh, the violations still exist. Um, and we we spoke about code enforcement earlier, and so this is, I guess, primarily conversation I've previously had with code enforcement but if if it's been done in the past or if we could do it in the future as another tool it's something I definitely want your feedback on and that is for our worst of the worst properties you know particularly code enforcement properties to show these people that we're getting serious much to councilman rover streets that you know we're bound by law the maximum fine is a thousand dollars however we can also elevate that to doing per day violations. That's correct. So what is, what is the history of uh, you trying those type cases and have they been successful? Uh, because that's definitely another tool that we need to look at utilizing further for some of these worst of the worst offenders. 
And, and we do need to look at that, but right now, because of personnel issues within my department as well as with the other city departments, we have not explored that yet, but it is something that we are going to explore. We have expanded on multifamilies that is um, that we did uh, go against now LLCs, and when we bring them in, into court, it's a minimum of $5,000 fine because of if you have multiple violations at your property address. So we did do that revision of, of the code on multi, with multifamily properties. Thank you. Uh, similar to Councilmember Overstreet, and you mentioned one of them, there are things I would like to talk to you offline about. Uh, so I'll, I'll reach out to uh, you and Solicitor Carter and uh, set up a meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank Colleagues, you all. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much. Next up, we have our municipal court uh, quarterly update, and uh, Chief Portis is uh, out under the weather today, uh, so our court administrator is going to deliver the that is quarterly correct. report. Good afternoon. I'm Rashida Davis, Court Administrator and Chief Clerk of Court for the Municipal Court of Atlanta. Thank you for having me here today. I have the pleasure of presenting our quarterly presentation, and we're going to start with our number one metric, which is traffic cases. There you go. I want to turn your attention to the months of June, July, August, and September. That's our previous quarter, which is our summer quarter of numbers and metrics. This is historically our largest quarter of receiving traffic, um, traffic cases. You'll see a comparison of the traffic cases filed in comparison to the traffic cases that are closed. On average, for this period of time, we've um, we uh, filed about 10,000 traffic cases, and there are about 8,900 cases closed on average on the month. So that for us is about 87% of our cases that we receive month over month are being closed out, which is a good percentage number for us. Um, that's about one and, and uh, I'm sorry, three and over three and four quarters uh, cases are getting resolved each month. I also want you to look at the months of April and May. Those are our highest cases that were filed. Uh, May in particular, 16,000, that was our highest number of traffic tickets that we received this year. There you go, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the next slide is our criminal cases. These are some of our more serious offenses. So um, these would be some of the thefts, public indecency charges, things of that nature that um, get filed in our court. On average for our summer quarter, we take in about a thousand of those cases and we resolve about half of those. So a little bit more than 540 cases each month are resolved. Those are a little bit more nuanced. They take a little bit more time, coordination with maybe victims. And so you'll find that our percentage average, our clearance rate is about 50%. Our next slide is our failure to appear cases. Uh, what you'll see at the beginning of this year was a downward trend for our failure to appear numbers. It ticked back up in the months of May and June and July. That can be for a number of reasons. Um, it's important to look back on those traffic cases filed. You'll see there were higher numbers in May and also in April. That month was 16,000. And so that also translates over here with failure to appear. It's right, the number of cases increases, the number of failure to appears increase. But we do think it will continue on a downward trend. Overall, we have just shy about 40,000 FTAs this year. Our next slide deals with our FTA court, which is a bright light for us. So as you can see, there are more cases being resolved that are in failure to appear status in this last quarter. So it's very exciting for us. More than 2,000 cases on average each month are being resolved through our FTA court. So if you look back on the previous slide, our, our numbers of 40,000, we're resolving about 40% of those numbers. Um, so that's a really good uh, number for us and an indicator. We operate at FTA court about four days a week. We also have a FTL trial court calendar as well. 
So that's just a summary of our metrics, the things that we focus on for this year, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Davis. Uh, usually you'll do my colleagues first, but I'm, I've got a few questions here. Um, on <clears throat> When you say that a case is closed, um, is that do you count a case closed to you as an municipal court? Count a case closed uh, if it gets bound over to state court? Uh, we would count that number as a case closed in, inside of our court. I will say that on average, we have about 300 cases that get bound over to Fulton County State Court or Superior Court, sometimes to Cab and Clayton County because it depends on the county the offense was in. Um, speaking of that, uh, of course, that's not a metric we've requested or reviewed before, but I would like to see um, the numbers of cases bound over to state court, and let's just say this year. Absolutely. Uh, and then also break that down uh, by charge. We could do that, please. Oh, yes. We can definitely uh, provide those numbers to you. These are numbers we also have to track and provide. Uh, for the body that governs us that oversees our numbers, which is the administrative office of court So we have to keep those numbers as well And how much time does the court need to prepare that and get that over to us? We can get that to you before the end of the week probably midweek. Great. Yeah um, and the uh, like We all had a little Adverse reaction up here when we saw the 40,000 FDA's yeah. Yeah. Uh, year to date um, Unless you have an army working for you. I don't take it that all of these are put in that number one warrants are issued those warrants are put into GCIC so if someone gets pulled over they can be taken in on that warrant so out of those almost 40,000 cases like how many of those actually that that judges issue warrants for how many of those are put into GCIC uh, talk to me a little bit more about that okay so the fair to process is of course rooted in state law uh, the first item that a court is required to do is one give someone the opportunity to be notified about their failure to appear and that applies to all of our traffic offenses which is the bulk of our FTAs so they have 30 days uh, pursuant to state law to address the FDA and to reconcile it if they do that then that's where that cart stops that they don't reconcile that FTA if they don't come in they don't go through FTA court the next step would be for that um, information to be provided to the judge. The judge has the opportunity to sign a warrant. Most of our judges do sign warrants in those cases. We also have a team downstairs in our warrants department that uh, works and partners with APD to um, put up the signed warrants on GCIC. And that is actually something new that we've been doing this year and assisting in that regard by putting up those um, warrant cases on GCIC with our own staff. Okay. And, uh if I may add to my request, um, we're given the cases, but the number of cases that are closed. I would also like, in addition to my previous request, uh, the number of FTA warrants uh, signed this year and the number put into GCIC, if that can be provided as well. Absolutely. And at this point, I would defer to my colleagues, starting out with Councilmember Bond. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation. I'd like to kind of follow up on what the chair was uh, inquiring about the FTAs. I mean, that is a shocking number, uh, 40,000 cases. How many of those FTAs are, I guess, do you, well, I would assume you have the, you can delineate uh, from those who've been arrested by APD, right, as opposed to those who've been ticketed. Can you give us that information also? Uh, you're asking, do we have the numbers for the uh, individuals who are apprehended on that yes. warrant? Oh, uh, yes, we do. And can you add that to what you distribute to us? Uh, yes. His request. And uh, I know that Chief Portis had talked about at some point for those who are arrested and taken through the municipal uh, jail, ACDC, at one point they had an 80% failure rate. Do you have any information about that or, or has that improved? Because I know that Judge Portis, uh, in a conversation I had with him some months ago, he talked about that he was going to get with the corrections chief to see if they could work out, I guess, a notification issue between the 
municipal court and the jail because apparently the jail is allowing people to continue to sign their own bond without the knowledge of any FTA or holds that might be pending in the court. Has there been any progress on that? Are you, are you aware of that? Uh, yes, we are in the process of ramping up our pretrial division. Pretrial typically works hand in hand with our in custody calendar and they can make recommendations for release of an individual based on their background history and their caseload. At this time, we are adding some additional personnel and the personnel that we do have are receiving some additional training. So I know that's an, a priority for our chief judge and something that we're working on. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with the pretrial program because we had that for almost 30 years before the abomination of bail reform in 2018 was put in place and eliminated it and caused this uh, deluge of people uh, just not coming to court once they get out. Uh, so is that is that plan to replace uh, the bail reform program that we have today to reinstate that in full? I'm not f familiar with that portion. I do know that our chief judge is working in partnership with the corrections chief to work out something um, that can be an asset and in addition to what is currently available. Well, I mean, anything will be an improvement over what is currently on the books. I mean, the sentiment was right to want to do bail reform. And it's not directed at you, so I don't want you to feel like you're on blast or anything. <laughs> but the sentiment was right, but it was probably one of the crappiest laws that's ever been written to ever come out of an administration. I have to beat that dead horse until it is... Uh, I grind its bones to make bread uh, because I screamed at the top of my lungs at the time and begged the previous administration, you know, not to do it. And then when they did do it, to try to repair it. So I'm actually excited that uh, Chief Judge Portis and our correction chief are making progress, you know, because Atlanta had something to be proud of already because we had a pretrial release program that released people on their own recognizance made arrangements, followed up, made sure people came to court so that victims and those who are arrested can both receive justice before the bar. And that has not been the case since 2018. So I'm very excited about that and look forward to hearing uh, more about it in the future. But with that, I'll withdraw. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Councilmember Amos. Yes, thank you for the information. Um, just wondering, out of the failure to appear, what is the number of people that's not coming for housing code violations and things of that nature, MRM that has appeared in front of, well, supposed to appear in front of the court? Do you have that breakdown? Uh, I don't have that breakdown. We can pare down that number once we pull the information um, that was requested by the chair and council member Bond. We can narrow, narrow that down as well by statutes All right, thank and you. ordinance. Council member Norwood. Yes, I talked with Chief Portis um, months ago, and he was prepared to bring us a list of charges that should, that where the person should be seen by the judge, where they are not just released on their own recognizance. So it was a, a very thoughtful way of, of trying to make some reform to what had happened that Mr. Bond is so concerned about. Could you please ask him to bring us that uh, next meeting or prior to the next meeting, those things, those recommendations that um, the court, the court wants us to take a look at, because I think time is of the essence to try to figure out how we don't um, totally rescind what was decided, but be very thoughtful in which charges deserve a greater amount of scrutiny and attention. Definitely. Any other colleagues? All right. One more request. Um, I would request, I don't know the last time we received one, um, I would like an organizational chart of the municipal court, uh, including uh, administration. Uh, APDs is a good one to look at that they provide us. It provides the name of the person, their contact info uh, in that position, and then also, if you would, uh, list the judges out and uh, I guess the majority of the cases they uh, preside over. Can do. All right. 
Thanks so much. All right, thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it. And before I go, I just would like to extend an invitation to come visit our court. For the folks who have already come, we appreciate you. But the ones who haven't, we would love to host you so you can see the good men and women and the work that they do at our courthouse. Councilmember Boone, hopping in with a question. Thank you so much for being here. Also, um, to add to Mr. Hillis's information, the ad hoc judges, the substitute judges, mm -hmm. We'd like to see that information as well. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Um, we do have one communication, which is uh, actually a, comes with another presentation. Uh, so we're getting a record number of uh, four presentations in today. So uh, you'll read that communication in. Twenty two C five one six six, a communication from Danielle Hampton, Chair, Audit Committee, submitting the Atlanta Fire Rescue Department Financial Transaction Review. Mr. Jones. So uh, our Good auditor is out today, so this is going to be presented uh, by you. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Count, uh, Ch uh, Chairman uh, Hillis. Um, good afternoon, council members and my name is Michael Jones with the City Auditor's Office. I don't know if you can hear me well or not. Pull the mic down a little bit. It may help. All right. Let me make sure I can. Okay. Okay. Do we actually have? Do we actually have the presentation? That's actually the report. <laughs> yeah, so we, we have the report in hand as well. Uh, okay. But we did not receive a presentation. Okay. I can, um, I can kindly go through it. <clears throat> um, I'll give the presentation for the fire and uh, financial transaction review. The fire chief requested an audit of the department's financial transactions between February 2008 and February 2000, I'm sorry, February 2018 through February 2021. The team for this audit is, was Rebecca Robinson and Erwin Coleman, who is in the audience with me today. We sought to answer the following question. Are FIRE's business affairs financial control sufficient to ensure compliance with the city's policy? Again, our scope was February 2018 through, through February 2021. Our methodology included interviewing FIRE staff, reviewing accounts payable and procurement policies, analyzing the daily report form and its supporting documentation, Oracle accounts analysis reports, Acela invoices and receipts, a seller fire fees by date report and Oracle's paid invoices with PO report for the month of January 2022. Uh, a summary of our findings, fire does not segregate incompatible duties associated with the invoicing, payment, con payment collection and record keeping. The department does not reconcile revenue and the report the department would use for reconciliation is inaccurate. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. As you know, the city auditor is Amanda Noble with the uh, deputy city auditor Stephanie Jackson. I'm the performance audit manager. And again, I mentioned earlier, Rebecca Robinson was a performance audit supervisor for this project and Erwin Coleman, who was here with me in the audience. As I mentioned earlier, the objective, um, Okay, our findings overview. This slide summarizes those findings. Fire does not segregate incompatible duties associated with the invoicing, payment, con payment collection, and record keeping. The department does not reconcile revenue, and the report the department would use for reconciliation is inaccurate. The department is recording special events revenues to a trust fund expense account rather than a revenue account. Sorry, I have to put my glasses on. 
The staff told, also told us that the department does not have written policies and procedures. And finally, the department appears to be compliant with the counts payable and procurement uh, policies. This is exhibit two on page nine of the report showing how business affairs collects fees for inspections, special events and plan reviews for the Office of Techno Technical Services and the Office of Support Services. Staff sums transactions and fills out the daily report which is shown on the right without reviewing a seller or transactions to ensure that all payments are included and accurately recorded. This lack of reconciliation provides an opportunity for fraud and allows errors to go undetected. Our reconciliation of payments recorded as received in January of 2022 to payments submitted to the Office of Revenue identified 6,397 unaccounted for and, for and other errors. This matter has been referred to the Office of Inspector General for further investigation. The Acela fire fees paid by date report is also inaccurate. Staff provided us with a report to identify invoices paid in January of 20, 2022. The report erroneously showed over $95,000 in payments collected because it pulls aggregated invoice and payment totals by record ID instead of pulling the invoice and payment for each invoice. This is exhibit five on page 12 the report of the report showing how staff processes special event fees. One staff person invoices customers and receives and records payments for permits for special events. And one staff person performs these same duties for inspection. Dividing responsibilities is an important control to ensure that no one person controls all key aspects of, the transa of a transaction. In our recommendation related to this finding, we noted spe specific elements of that written policies and procedures should include. This is on page two of the report. Written procedures along with effect effective enforcement could improve the consistency and the enforcement of stated practices such as authorizing purchases on the internal request purchase form and processing collected payments at least weekly. Having written policies and procedures establish internal controls and mitigates the risk that knowledge is limited to a few personnel, few personnel. We issued four recommendations related to the findings in this memo and the fire chief agreed with all of them. We recommend that the fire chief develop written policies and procedures for handling financial transactions, direct customers to pay for fire inspections, special events and plan reviews through the Office of Revenues cashiers to separate invoicing and collection, separate the permitting and invoicing functions for special events in the interim so that no single individual may, be, may issue a permit and create an invoice, and finally, work with the system administrator to correct the Acela's fire fees paid by date report. And please note that the, we made a recommendation in the citywide cash handling audit for the accounting era that associated with recording revenue in the, in the expense account. And that concludes my report. Um, the, you can see the full report on atlantaaudit.org. And I'll open up for any questions you may have. Colleagues, questions, comments? All right. And it's been a minute since we've done an audit. Do we file this or do we refer to the full council? Okay, I'll make a motion to accept and file. Second, Second by Councilman Roverstreet. Please prepare the vote. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. This audit is accepted and filed. Thank you, Mr. Jones, for your presentation you, and your service.
All right, well, with all those presentations, the good news is we do have a fairly light legislative agenda, so we will move on to that. I'll make a motion uh, to accept all favorable claims, items one through six. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice Chair Amos. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. Please vote. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. Those items are favorable. I will make a motion to adverse all unfavorable claims, items 7 through 36. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Boone. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. Those items are adverse. We do have one first read, 2201804. If you'll please read that in. An ordinance by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee amending the FY 2023 Intergovernmental Grant Fund Budget Department of Police by adding to anticipations and appropriations in the amount of $134,528.16 for the 2023 Highway Enforcement of Aggressive Traffic Grant from Governor's Office of Highway Safety and for other purposes. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to our regular agenda, ordinances for second reading. Uh, first, we have item two, which is 220-1745. Uh, go ahead and read that in, please. An ordinance by Council Member Byron D. Amos to amend the Charter of the City of Atlanta, Georgia, 1996 Georgia Laws, adopted under and by virtue of the authority of the Municipal Home Rule Act of 1965, OCGA Section 36-335-1, as amended by Amending Part 1, Appendix 4, to amend the Atlanta Citizens Review Board membership compensation and for other purposes. The Charter Amendment, so this will be its third reading. We'll refer it on to the... Uh, full council uh, for its final approval, so I will make a motion to approve. Second by Councilmember Amos. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The item is favorable. Uh, moving on to resolutions, we have item number three, 22R 4522. A resolution by Council Member Amir Faroqi authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute a special procurement agreement pursuant to Section 2-1191.1 on behalf of the City of Atlanta with to serve with vendor not listed to serve as operator for the Center for Diversion Services in accordance with the intergovernmental agreement between City of Atlanta and Fulton County, Georgia, which designates that the city will engage a third party vendor that will manage the administrative, financial and building related functions of the Center for Diversion and Services for an annual term of one year, which shall be renewable for two consecutive two year terms upon Atlanta City Council approval and for other purposes. Still waiting those fill-ins, so we've been asked to hold this item, so I'll make such a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Overstreet. Please prepare the vote to hold. The vote is open. The vote is closed. 5A, 0 nays. That item is favorable. Item 4, uh, actually item number 4 and 5 are both um, Reemployments under 3505B, so if we could read those in together and we'll take those as a block, please. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the reemployment of City of Atlanta retiree, Senior Police Officer Nathan Port in the Atlanta Police Department for an annual compensation not to exceed $72,000. $255.20 pursuant to section 3-505B of the Charter of the City of Atlanta and for other purposes. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the reemployment of City of Atlanta retiree Police Sergeant Curtis Davenport in the Atlanta Police Department for an annual compensation not to exceed $90,230.40 pursuant to section 3-505B of the Charter of the City of Atlanta and for other purposes. We heard nothing from the APD presentation is that we need to retain and recruit more officers, so I'll make a motion to approve both of these items, Deputy Chief Peak. Um, is there a second? 
Second by Vice Chair Amos. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. IBA zero nays. Those two items are favorable. Uh, item number six and seven, uh, 22R4572 and 22R4573 are also alike in their character and their settlements. So if you can please read those in together. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of claims against the City of Atlanta in the matter of Trinity Smith versus City of Atlanta, a pre-litigation pre claim in the amount of $6,800.00. Authorizing the settlement amount to be charged to and paid from the account numbers listed herein. Authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to distribute the settlement amount and for other purposes. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against the City of Atlanta in the case of Pamela Hill versus City of Atlanta, Civil Action File Number 121CV05087, United States District Court, Northern District of Georgia, in the amount of $65,000.00 authorizing said amount to be paid from the account numbers listed herein, authorizing the chief financial officer to distribute the total settlement amount and for other purposes. Make the motion to approve both those items or a second? Second. Second by Council Member Boone. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. Those two items are favorable. I don't believe there are any held items we need to act on. Is that correct? That is all, Mr. Chair. Completed our legislative agenda, uh, objectives of our meeting. Unless colleagues have any questions, comments, concerns, or well wishes. All right. Thank you all for attending. And by unanimous consent of members present,